Well, good morning. Well, we're going to continue to talk about our dress code. And we are going to be, again, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 to start. And as you, uh, if you want to open there, you can. And then we're going to look at a couple passages this morning. Got a lot of ground to cover, so you're going to have to listen fast this morning. And I also forgot my watch, but I do notice there's a clock there. But if it starts to get me incredibly late, just throw something at me. Oh boy. I'll try to. It's good motivation for me not to go too long. Got a question for you. Can you remember a time when someone showed you kindness? I just want you to think about that minute. I just want you to, to take a couple of minutes and just think about a time where someone maybe went out of their way. Maybe you were having a bad day. Maybe you needed some help. But somebody showed you kindness. And I want you to think about how did that make you feel? How did it make you feel when someone showed you kindness? And then I want you to think about this. Has there been a time where you showed someone kindness? And how did that make you feel? Yesterday we talked about compassion and how God calls us to be clothed with compassion. We're looking at these five things that Paul writes about in Colossians 3.12 that we're to clothe ourselves with. And each of them are not just something that, that Paul sort of arbitrarily says, you need to wear this because I think this is what would be good. But these are each things that Jesus himself demonstrated and lived out. And it's his desire, God's desire, that his characteristics be evident in our life. And so when we're thinking about wearing these things and thinking about this dress code, it's not so much about a list of rules of these things that you have to wear. It's about understanding who Jesus is and understanding his compassion and his kindness so that we can then clothe ourselves with that. And so this morning as we talk about kindness, I want you to not only be thinking about the fact that God calls us to be kind, but I want you to think about the kindness of Jesus. And so we're going to take some time to, to look at that. But just to refresh ourselves this morning, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. You know, it always amazes me when I read the Gospels to see the kindness of Jesus. And one of the things that I, I want to, to see happen this week is, again, not only for you to see your need to clothe yourselves with these attributes, but to see them in Jesus and to see your Savior as bearing and having these attributes. Jesus was kind. This word in, for kindness comes from a root word that means virtuous, good, or useful. I found some synonyms for kindness because I... Oh, they're not there. That's okay. There they are. Some synonyms for kindness because I know you guys like synonyms. So we have kind-hearted. That's kind of hard to say this early in the morning. Kindness... Warm-hearted, caring, affectionate, loving, warm, considerate, helpful, thoughtful, obliging, unselfish, selfless, altruistic, good, attentive, compassionate, sympathetic, understanding, big-hearted, benevolent, friendly, neighborly, hospitable, and well-meaning. These are all words that help us grab onto this concept that we want to talk about today. That this is a characteristic that should be evident in our lives. We are instructed to clothe ourselves with kindness and as a follower of Christ, as a follower of Jesus, kindness should be a characteristic that you are known for. If, if you know Jesus as your Savior, if you're God's child, kindness should be something that defines your life. When people think about you, when people talk about you, they should say, I know this person and they are kind. When we think about kindness in the Bible, there's about 50 or 60 times that the, this idea of kindness is used. And it's always about acts of grace, showing undeserved favor to others. And here's the thing. It's pretty easy to be kind to people that you like or people that are nice to you or kind to you, isn't it? Have you ever noticed that? It's, it's not really hard to be kind to people that you like, generally. But how about people that you don't like? Somebody help me out here. Is it easy to be kind to people that are mean to you? Is it easy to be kind to people that don't treat you well? Is it easy to be kind to people that are rude to you? How many would you say it's easy? Anybody? How many would you say it's really hard? All right. It is really hard. In fact, it seems to be nearly impossible. But as we're going to see this morning, God calls us to have a supernatural kindness that enables us. Look at Luke chapter 6, verse 35 for just a couple minutes here. 
Luke 6.35. This is Jesus' words. He says, love your enemies. You know, there's some things that Jesus said that I wish he hadn't said. Anybody else there with me? All right, sometimes, you know, you're reading through the Gospels and you're like, oh, if you just, did you have to say that? It would be a lot easier if you hadn't said that. Love your enemies and do good and lend and expect nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for He is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. Let's just step back and, and just think about that for a moment. He is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. Kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. And Jesus didn't just say these things. He, he didn't just say this, he modeled them and he lived them out. What I want to do this morning in, in the time that we have is I want to look at two Samaritans this morning to help frame our understanding of kindness. So we're going to look at the good Samaritan and the bad Samaritan. Alright? Now, question for you. Do you want to hear about the good Samaritan first or the bad Samaritan first? The bad Samaritan. The bad Samaritan. Alright. It's interesting. I, I shared this message in a church a few weeks ago and they said the same thing. And my answer to them was, sorry. The slides right there, so, we're going to look at the Good Samaritan first. <laughs> You're going to have to wait to find out about the Bad Samaritan. So, let's, uh, let's think about these two Samaritans and what we can learn from them. So, Luke chapter 10, and we're going to look at verses 29 through 37. Probably a passage um, that is quite familiar to you. Luke chapter 10, and uh, beginning in verse 29. Luke 10. Uh, beginning in verse 29. Now, to sort of set this up, we might want to back up. Let's just back up to verse 25. It says, Behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So there's this lawyer, and he's having this conversation with Jesus, and he basically wants to know what he can do in order to earn eternal life. Now we know that he is off to a faulty premise there, right? We, we know that there's nothing we can do to earn eternal life or earn God's favor. But he thinks in his mind that he can. And Jesus sort of lets him run out with this thought and he sort of answers him according to his thoughts. So he says to Jesus, uh, Jesus says back to him, you want to know what to do in her eternal life? Well, well, tell me, what do you understand about the law? He says, so he says there in verse 26, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Basically saying, how, how do you, what, what is your understanding of what God requires? And the guy gets the answer absolutely right. Look at the answer. He says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. He got the answer right. He had the right answer right here. He knew the answer. He says, what's your understanding of the law? What's your understanding of what God requires? And he says, to love God and love people. And Jesus says, absolutely, now do that and you'll be fine. Well, the guy knows in his heart that he hasn't always done this. And so it says that he wanted to justify himself. Look at verse 29. But he, desiring to justify himself, he said, who is my neighbor? He's like, I, I get this, I have to love God and I have to love people, I have to love my neighbor, so who is it? Who is my neighbor? I mean, because really everybody can't be my neighbor, right? And so who is my neighbor? Who do I have to love? Who do I have to be kind to? And so Jesus tells a parable, tells a story, and you know it very well. It says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan. All right? And if you know anything about Jews and Samaritans, you know when, they, when Jesus got to this part of the story, they were just in agony. Right? A Samaritan. All right? The Samaritans were half Jews and half Gentile. They were products of the Assyrian captivity. They were Jews that had been taken away way back in, in uh, 17, 722 B.C. And they had intermarried and intermingled with Gentiles. They would moved back. They lived in a region north of Jerusalem, what we call Samaria. And that they did not get along with uh, the Jews. And so he says, a Samaritan. 
as he journeyed, came up to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And his compassion led him to do something. He went to him and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. So Jesus says, Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, and he could only say, the one who showed him mercy or kindness. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So here's the scene real quickly that Jesus paints. It says, basically this guy, he gets robbed, he gets beaten, and the road from Jerusalem to Jericho goes down quite a bit in elevation. It goes through a very much a wilderness area. And when you think about wilderness, there's absolutely nothing there. Rocks and hills, there's no trees, there's nothing. It was dangerous. And so this man's been beaten. He's, he's dying on the side of the road. And the, le- the priest comes along, the one who's there to represent God to the people. And he looks at him and thinks, that's not a risk I'm willing to take. That's, I, I've got important things to do, I've got places to be, that's dirty, I, that's dangerous, wants nothing to do with it. Then the Levite comes by and they assisted, they were not descendants of Aaron, but they were, uh, they were served in the temple. Basically, like he's the associate pastor, okay? So the pastor came by, he wanted nothing to do with the guy. The associate pastor came by, wanted nothing to do with so the just I'm going to go by on the other side and just pretend, just pretend I didn't see it. Then the Samaritan comes along. And the intriguing thing is, this guy is probably Jewish. And the Samaritan, if if the roles were reversed, right? If it was the Samaritan lying on the side of the road, this man who's laying on the side of the road probably would have not even looked at him. But he chooses to go over, and at his own cost, and his own expense, at his own risk to his own life, he goes over there and he cares for him. He puts him on his animal, he takes him to a hotel, and he spends the night with him taking care of his wounds. And then he makes provision for him. And Jesus uses this story to tell us about who our neighbor is. Because in his mind, the Lord thinks, I get to pick who my neighbors are. I get to choose who my neighbors are. And Jesus says, you don't get to choose who your neighbor is. Because your neighbor is anyone who isn't you. Alright? You know, if you're wondering, who is my neighbor? Because some of you are probably asking that. Well, who is my neighbor? Your neighbor is anyone who isn't you. Alright? That's your neighbor. And Jesus says, go live this way. See, the man thought that others had to prove whether they were a neighbor or not. And Jesus said, it's the other way around. We don't choose our neighbors. We are to live lives clothed in kindness. Every day, there are people that we pass by that need kindness. Now, they might not be beaten half to death and laying on the side of the road like this man was, but every day, you pass people who need kindness. You might be able to see it, or maybe you don't see it. Because sometimes we hide our hurt and our pain, but every day, there are people in your life that need kindness. Jesus was kind. And He didn't just teach kindness. He lived it. So, now you're going to get your wish. We're going to talk about the bad Samaritan for a few minutes. And I know all of you are like, who is the bad Samaritan? How did I miss the bad Samaritan? Well, you haven't missed the bad Samaritan. You just never called her the bad Samaritan. John uh, chapter 4 is where you need to go next. John chapter 4. Again, a passage that's probably familiar, but just uh, let's... uh, Walk through it for a couple of minutes here, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, uh, heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. So he's, he is um, down in Judea in the southern part of Israel, and he's going to make a trip up to the northern part of Israel. And normally, the Jewish people would go the long way, all right? They, they would go the long way because to go the short way, would mean to go through Samaria. And that might mean you might run into Samaritans, and that just was not a possible thought. So they would travel around the region of Samaria, but Jesus decides to travel through Samaria. And Jesus always did everything very intentionally. All right? It wasn't just, well, let's go through Samaria. He had a purpose, and we're going to see that purpose in just a moment. 
And so it said, he came to a town of Samaria, verse 5, called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So let's just think about what's going on for a minute. Jesus is traveling through Samaria. I'm sure his disciples were a little bit thinking, why do we have to go through Samaria? But they followed him and they're traveling. And here in this passage, we see the humanity of Jesus. He's tired. He's weary. Jesus was fully God, but he was fully human as well. And although our minds can't fully wrap our brains around that fact, it's very true. Jesus was fully human. And as being human, he experienced the limitations of humanity. He's tired. He's exhausted. And so he sits down in the shade and his disciples go into town. They probably went to McDonald's, Taco Bell maybe, to get some food. You with me? All right. They didn't really go to McDonald's. I know that. And, of course, they couldn't get a cheeseburger. Um, Kosher. (laughs) They're not awake yet. yet. (laughs) I was like, they didn't get that. No bacon cheeseburger either. (laughs) And so while they go, Jesus sees this woman come to the well. Now it's unusual because the women usually came to the well together early in the morning and late in the evening. But here comes this woman in the middle of the day by herself and she's Samaritan. And Jesus speaks to her. And you might not think that that's weird or unusual, but it was really weird and really unusual for a couple of reasons. First of all, in their culture, a Jewish man would not speak to another woman in public. Secondly, Jews didn't speak to Samaritans. And so the fact that Jesus is a Jewish male and this is a Samaritan woman means she is not expecting this man that she sees sitting over in the shade by the well to speak to her. It's the furthest thing from her mind that he will address her. And look at what happens. It says, Jesus asked her, give me a drink. Interesting question, isn't it? He says, give me a drink. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? So she is, she is puzzled by this guy who does not seem to understand the social customs of the day. She is just absolutely astonished. I mean, he, it, it, she's not even processing, get me a drink. She's, why are you talking to me? But Jesus had a very, very important reason for talking to her. Because Jesus saw this woman for who she was. He knew all about her, and he knew the pain and the hurt that she carried. And so Jesus spoke to her, and just in simply speaking to her, he was showing kindness to her. Because this woman, she had a messed up life and a lot of baggage, and as you know the story, she was living in sin. She was an outcast. She was despised. She's lonely. And Jesus shows kindness to her. Simply by speaking to her, he has shown her kindness. He has elevated her status, and he has shown her importance that probably few were willing to do. He spoke kindly to her. And then he addresses her needs. Look at what happens. Jesus answered her. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying it to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, in her mind, the difference between living water and regular water was there was two types of wells in Israel. There was types of wells that simply collected rainwater and stored it, and then there was wells that had springs. And I think you can imagine which one you would prefer to drink from, right? All right, are you awake enough to figure that one out? Rainwater, it sits around for a few days, you have to kind of wipe the green slime off the top before you dip some up. Are you with me? All right, so do you want that, or do you want living water bubbling out of the ground, cold, clean, refreshing? Is it a hard choice? Not a hard choice, is it? And so Jesus says, you know, you have this water in this well, but if you knew who I was, and if you, if you asked me, I could give you living water. And she's sort of puzzled, and she looks at him, and she says, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and this well is deep. What's she saying? She says, I don't think that you can do what you just said. I don't think that you can do what you just said. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? 
He's thinking, yes, I am. <laughs> but he doesn't immediately answer. He gave us this well to drink from. And his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will soon become in him a spring of living, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to her, Sir, give me this water. She's like, I, I need that water. That water that you just talked about, I need that water. I don't want to ever have to come back here again. Go get your husband. And she thinks, uh-oh. She says, uh, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right. You've had five husbands. All right, we don't know all the circumstances. And I've dealt with a lot of relationship issues as a pastor in counseling. And, and sometimes it's one, sometimes the other. Usually it's both. But here's the thing. Five failed relationships probably might be you. All right, she obviously has some relationship issues. And then Jesus says, oh, and by the way, the guy you're living with now, you're not even married to. And she says, I perceive that you're a prophet. <laughs> Good call. And then, of course, she says, why don't we talk about theology instead of my sin? Right? Because it's easier to talk about theological concepts than to talk about our sin. A lot more comfortable, isn't it? So she says, let me ask you a question, now that I realize you're a prophet. She says, I've got a worship question. So they sort of have this back and forth. She says, we worship here, and, and the Jews, you worship there, and, and, and where should we worship? And then she says something really astonishing. She says, when the Messiah comes, he will make it clear. And Jesus looks at her, and he says, I am he. Think about this. Jesus chooses to reveal himself in a very powerful way to this outcast. This woman whose society had nothing to do with. I'm sure she was not the most popular person in her town. She couldn't even come to the well with the other women. I don't think they really trusted her around their husbands. Do you? I mean, this woman's life uh, yes, she was living in sin, and yes, she had a lot of problems, but her life was filled with pain. And her life was filled with hurt. And Jesus had an answer for her hurt and her pain. And he showed incredible kindness to her in revealing himself to her. When he makes this statement to her, she goes back to the town and she said, Hey, let me have your attention. And she brings people from her town out to hear about Jesus. See, Jesus didn't just talk about kindness. He lived kindness. Jesus is kind. And he was kind to that woman. He was kind to the people he encountered. And he has been kind to you. And he offered to this woman the answer to her brokenness. The answer to her pain. The answer to her searching and her longing and her desires that she was probably trying to find in human relationships. And he says, I have the answer for your brokenness. I have the answer for your pain. I have eternal life. Jesus has been kind to us. Look at Ephesians 2, 5 through 7, just for a minute. I want you to realize this point that Jesus didn't just talk about kindness. He didn't just suggest that we should be kind. He lived kindness. And he showed us incredible kindness. Ephesians chapter 2, it's one of my favorite chapters. Paul there says, Even when we were dead in our trespasses. You used to be dead, is what he says earlier in the chapter, right? He says, you used to be dead. And, and when you're dead, you can't do anything to change or improve your situation. He says, you were dead in your sin, but you have been made alive. He says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, you made us alive together with Christ. We've been made alive with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's your spiritual position right now if you know Christ. You are seated in the heavenlies, right? You are in Christ. Why? So that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace. All right, God loves to show off His grace in giving to us what we absolutely do not deserve. All right, this woman did not deserve Jesus' kindness and neither do you and neither do I. But he's chosen to show us. Listen, he says that he might show off the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness. 
towards us in Christ Jesus. Jesus has been incredibly kind to you in revealing himself to you and inviting you to know him and to experience eternal life in him. And as someone who has experienced the kindness of God, as someone who has experienced his kindness and now is in a living relationship with the one who is kind, he wants our lives to reflect that same kindness. He wants you to reflect the kindness of your Savior to this world. And so I just want to ask you, is your life clothed with kindness? If I were to ask the people that know you the best, so-and-so, are they kind? What would they say? What, what would be their answer? Because if you're a child of God, you're called to reflect the kindness of our Savior. Ephesians 4, 32. You know, there's parts of the Bible that are really hard to understand, aren't there? We were talking a little bit about this at breakfast. And there's some verses that you read and you just think, I don't think I'll ever understand that until I get to, to heaven and I can ask God himself. But there's some other things that we don't have to do a whole lot of praying about to figure out, right? And here's one of them. So, this is real straightforward. Be kind to one another. That's not real hard to figure out, is it? But it's really hard to do. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Paul's saying, never forget that God forgave you. Never forget what Jesus did for you. Never forget the kindness and the mercy and the forgiveness that he offered you and offers you still. So he says, based on that, be kind to one another. Treat each other kindly. Sometimes it's easy to be kind. Sometimes it's hard to be kind. Sometimes it will cost you a little bit to be kind. Sometimes it'll cost you a lot to be kind, like the Good Samaritan. But it's always worth it, because kindness has the ability to reduce the burdens of others. And we need to remember that the people around us are carrying burdens. Sometimes we know about them, sometimes we don't know about them. But I guarantee you, just look around for a moment. Just, just look around. Look at each other. All right. The people that you just look at carry far more pain and hurt than you will ever know or realize. And sometimes it's so easy to look at everybody else's life and think, man, they must just have a great life. They don't have any worries. They don't have any cares. They don't have any pro You ever think that? Sometimes. The people that we encounter have hurts and burdens. And kindness has the ability to reduce those burdens. And so I want to challenge you to seek to reduce the burdens of those around you. The Good Samaritan did. It's what Jesus did for the Bad Samaritan. He took her burden away. You know, so many times, we talked about this yesterday, we think it's our job to judge people, right? And, and, and it's a whole other sermon for a whole other day, but basically it's this. People who don't know Christ are judged already. Read John chapter 3. They're already condemned. They're already judged. Our job is to show them kindness and love. And then point them to the gospel. To point them to their need of forgiveness and repentance and to know Christ. God desires that we treat everyone, even the people that are not like us, even the people that don't share our values, our beliefs, we're to treat them with kindness. You know, sometimes I, I see things and I hear things and, 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 and I have, just as you, not always been as kind as I should, but sometimes I see things and I'll see a post on Facebook and it's, God doesn't believe in atheists. Really? He died for them. I think he believes in them, right? How, if you were an atheist and you knew a Christian was posting that, would you feel like Christians were kind? Would you feel like they're judgmental? And maybe not a group of people that you really would want to be associated with. See, people need to see the kindness of our Savior. If they're ever going to desire a relationship with him, they need to know he's kind. And they'll only know he's kind if we show kindness. Because they're not going to pick up the Bible probably. They're not going to read about his kindness. They're not going to discover his kindness unless we show kindness. So my challenge for you today is to do kindness. I understand the grammatical problems with that statement. I actually did that intentionally so that you would remember it. My challenge for you today is to do kindness. Because as we talked about yesterday, we have this tendency to, to read the Bible and study the Bible and believe the Bible. And just like that lawyer who knew the answers, right? He knew the answer, love God, love people. But he didn't want to do it. And that's why he asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Who do I really have to love? And so I want to challenge you to do kindness today. To put it into practice. 
So start with those who are closest. Maybe you can find a way to be kind to your roommate this week. The cafeteria workers. And when you go home, I want you to practice kindness. And here's the thing. Start with the people that are closest to you. Start with your family. <laughs> right? Because that's where it's the hardest place to live out your faith is at home. Be kind to your church family. What would happen in our churches if we practice kindness with each other? Dressing with kindness is the key to preventing bad relationships. It helps us defeat the tendency to be prideful or quarrelsome or envious. It's really hard to be quarrelsome, to be envious, and all those things if you're being kind. And so I want to challenge you to not fight your Heavenly Father when He calls you to dress a certain way. Remember that when He asks you to dress in this way, it's not because of a list of rules, but it's because of the relationship that you have with Him. Remember back in Colossians 3, it says you are chosen by God, you're in a relationship with God, you're holy, you're set apart, and you're beloved. And as the beloved of God, He wants us to reflect that. So I just want you to take a couple minutes before we close and just reflect on what we've, we've talked about. Jesus said something very challenging. Love your enemies and do good. Lend and expect nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes just for a couple moments before we head on to the busyness of the day and the challenges that await you? And just ask your Father in Heaven. See, Am I reflecting the kindness that you want me to reflect? And, and as you think about that, I just want you to just take a moment and to think about the kindness of your Savior. And, and just maybe for a moment, just, just in your imagination, and I'm a big believer in imagination. Maybe it comes from having a four-year-old and a two-year-old. But I've always sort of had an overactive imagination, but I believe it's something God gives us. And I just want you to imagine Jesus, however you picture Him. However you picture him, look, I just want you to picture him having that conversation with that woman at the well. I want you to imagine the well and imagine this woman. And I just want you to picture the kindness with which Jesus spoke to her. And just for a minute, be overwhelmed with the kindness that Jesus has shown you. How he came to you and offered you forgiveness and eternal life. And then just ask Him to say, help me to reflect that kindness today to the people I meet. Help me to reflect that kindness even to the people who are not kind to me. Father, I thank You for the opportunity this morning to open Your Word together and to allow Your Word, which is living and powerful and true, to speak into our lives. And Father, I thank You for the kindness that You have shown us. Father, I thank You for the kindness that You've shown us in offering us such overwhelming grace that would forgive all of our sin, past, present, and future. Father, thank You for dealing kindly with us. And may we reflect kindness today to one another, to the people here on the Houghton campus. And as we go throughout our lives to the people that we encounter every day. Father, may we always remember that people around us carry burdens and hurt and pain and they need kindness and we have it. So Father, may we clothe ourselves with it and share it with a world that needs it. And Father, we ask for your grace to do it. In Jesus' name, amen.